Father, we're thankful for promises like that in your word, that you'll take care of us, that you are faithful, and no matter where we are or where hard our heart might be, Lord, that you are faithful, that your spirit is there with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us. You love us. And so I pray as we boast upon about that faithfulness of yours again this morning, Lord, that it would encourage our hearts, fill us with gratitude and hope and joy. Point us to Jesus through your word this morning, Lord, and may he be glorified through all that's said and done. In his name we pray, amen. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I encourage you to open back up to the first book of the Bible, uh, Genesis. We're, we're going to pick up in chapter 21 today, Genesis chapter 21. Remember, a few weeks ago, we talked about Genesis, uh, the beginning of Genesis 21. We, we looked at uh, Isaac being born as the promised son. But if you remember right, uh, Abraham, though not with his wife Sarah, but rather her slave girl Hagar, had a son already, and that son's name was Ishmael. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Ishmael and the relationship between Abraham and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac. As you can imagine, there was some tension in the family, and that tension began to rise. Just reminds us as we go to Scripture this morning that there was turmoil in the patriarch Abraham's family, just like all of our families. There, there's never, it's never a clean slate. The Bible doesn't pretend like everything's hunky-dory all the time. There's hardships, there's, there's, there's problems, and a lot of times those problems derive because of sin. Abraham's and Sarah's sin catches up with them, and the family is torn apart through very um, difficult circumstances, as we'll see this morning. So we pick up where we left off, off uh, there in Genesis 21, verse 8. We look at the account of Abraham and Sarah and their newborn promised son Isaac. Look at verse 21, or chapter 21, verse 8. And the child grew and was winged. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. So now we fast forward from the birth to his weaning. This would have, I'm told, taken place uh, around two to three years old. It was a, a celebrated event that congratulated the child on being able to eat and drink on his own as well as being able to spend more time with dad. Believe it or not, at that young age, the child would begin to learn how to work, how to help his dad in small ways and uh, wouldn't have to stay with mom the entire time. Abraham celebrated this by making a great feast. It was meant to be an exciting day for the family. But as with a lot of times today, when there's family celebrations, there can also be trouble. Verse 9, Sarah saw that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, who she had bore to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. So rejoicing quickly turns to drama. When Sarah sees Abraham's eldest son Ishmael laughing at her son Isaac, her mama, bears, her, her mama bear claws immediately come out. Now keep in mind, and this is hard to believe and it's hard to pick up from the context, but Ishmael would have been 16 or 17 by this time. I know that because Abraham was 86 when Ishmael was born. He is now 100 years old. Okay, or would have been 100 years old when Isaac was born. He would have now been at least... Ishmael would have been 16 or 17. He's a young man at this time. So this is not just one little child making fun of another child. This is a man ridiculing his half-brother. 
In fact, the Apostle Paul uses the word persecuted to describe Ishmael's behavior here. In Galatians 4.29, he says, Just at, as at the time he was, who was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, that's Isaac. He was jealous of his brother being celebrated. It's very possible that since there was turmoil between his mother and Sarah, that he didn't receive this celebration when he was weaned. He was the child of Sarah's slave, but Isaac was the son of the queen herself. And Sarah recognizes that Ishmael will always, it will always be hard for him. He will always be hard on Isaac since he's so much older and much less privileged than Isaac. Can you just imagine if you were the older brother in this situation? Certainly, he would not just stand by and contently watch Isaac receive Abraham's full inheritance and full blessing. I mean, as the older brother, to just watch your younger brother get everything and you get nothing. I mean, he already had, Isaac already had God's full blessing because he, af- he was, after all, the promised child. So Sarah instructs Abraham to get rid of the slave girl and her son since he has no reason to stay. He's a young adult now, and he will receive nothing from Abraham. God has made that clear. All of his inheritance will go to Isaac. Since he seems unlikely to willingly serve his younger brother, it's best that he leaves. Now, what's clear from the cruel language here is that Sarah is upset. Throw her away is the idea behind get rid of her. But even though her heart is not in the right place, Sarah does correctly recognize an underlining problem that is not just going to solve itself. Obviously, Abraham is close to his son. That's why he's very displeased by the idea of throwing him out. But as we see in the next verse, Sarah is not completely out of place here. Verse 12 says that God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So God told Abraham, listen to your wife, Sarah. Now, as we saw earlier, before Isaac was born, Abraham planned to give his inheritance to Ishmael. But God had other plans. And Abraham struggled to accept God's plan. He's been struggling with it for all of these years. He's torn inside. He wanted to at least give some of his inheritance to Ishmael. But that was not God's plan. And Sarah reminds him, remember... God said that that Isaac will get the inheritance. So God reaffirms that this is his plan and that he will bless Abraham's offspring only through his son Isaac. So God commands Abraham to send away his firstborn son and his son's mother. Now, it seems to me that because God refers to Hagar as Abraham's slave girl here, previously God referred to her as his wife. It's possible that she's no longer his wife. But Abraham was not pleased about sending Hagar away either. She too held a special place in his heart. This command from God would have been very difficult for Abraham to obey. Now, it's only fair that since I've mentioned before that it's not always right for husbands to listen to their wife, which is what got Abraham in this predicament in the first place, I'm guessing it's only right for me to point out 
that sometimes God does want us to listen to our wives, as is the case here, even when she seems to be speaking out of anger or frustration. Abraham did not want to deal with an imminent problem that was only going to get worse because of his relationship with his firstborn son. His feelings were blinding him to what needed to happen. I mean, Isaac is at that age, or Ishmael is at that age where if he's going to go off and, and start his own great nation, now's the time to do it. Sarah saw that. Abraham did not. So Sarah, though she was upset, was right in discerning that there was only one way to fix this problem. Sometimes we need to trust our wife because they can discern things that we're blinded to. The difficult part is discerning when to listen to them and when not to. And we could turn this thing fully around and say the same things for wives and husbands. For the most part, unless our wife is telling us to do something that is wrong, we should as men, as husbands, at least heed her advice. Abraham should not have just thrown her advice to the side so quickly. I have to admit, if I was in Abraham's shoes, I probably would have thought, well, she's just upset. And just disregarded what she was saying. But God said she was right. So I got to point out, don't, don't disregard your wife just because of her emotions. Underneath all those emotions are often words of wisdom. God knows heeding to his wife's words will be very hard for Abraham. So he reminds him of the promise for Ishmael. Not only did Isaac have a promise, Ishmael had a promise too. Verse 13, and I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also because he is your offspring. This is what God promised Abraham earlier that should have made him think, hey, we're going to have to do something here. We've got two nations together right here. That we, we can't have two nations coming to form in the exact same place. They're going to have to separate at some point. God promises to make a nation out of Ishmael since he's Abraham's son. This means that God's provisionary hand would be upon Ishmael. God is promising to take care of Ishmael. Abraham can rest assured that God will bless his son. Verse 14, so Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Though it was very difficult to do, Abraham obeyed God and sent his son away. Now, we shouldn't overthink this too much. This does not mean Ishmael will never see his father again. We actually know that he does. It, it just meant that he had to go and start life on his own. He had to go elsewhere and start from scratch. I think the hardest part of this for Abraham would have been sending his son off with nothing. Nothing but a little bit of water. That's what it would have been really hard because Abraham was tremendously blessed. He could have sent him with a whole bunch of things to help him get this, this nation started. But God didn't allow him to do that. And Abraham is so obedient that he doesn't want to send him with too much. God said he doesn't get anything. So I'm not giving him anything but a little bit of water. Simply provided some needs for the beginning of his journey. And Abraham knows Abraham trusts that God will provide as he promised to do. And Abraham knows that God can provide because he did for him. 
So Abraham gives Hagar only a few provisions, enough to begin the journey and gives her his son and sends them on their way. Ultimately, we see that Abraham entrusts his son to God. She departs and wanders in the wilderness, which was not far from where Abraham was. Never really goes very far from where Abraham was. Verse 15, when the water in the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shop. For she said, look, let let me not look on the death of a child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. I've seen a, a video rendition of this, and it is a little infant that is put under the bush in the, in the video that I watched of this. But again, Abraham is not a small child. He's a young man, and still, Ish, our Hagar doesn't want to sit there and watch her son die, so she puts him under a bush or a small tree in order to keep him shade from the sun. The water had run out. Ishmael quickly gets dehydrated. He's not able to go on. Hagar doesn't know what to do. If she could have carried the child, it would have been a lot easier, but she can't. She would have been weak as well. So she sets him in the shade, and she goes where she can't see her son die an agonizing death. Death can come quickly once a person is dehydrated. She begins crying. God hears Ishmael's voice. And he speaks for a second time to Hagar. He had promised her earlier to make her son into a great nation. Now, she just wants to see her son live. She doubts the promise of God in this dire moment. Verse 17, God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. So God reminds Hagar that she has no reason to fear because He will make Ishmael into a great nation. He commands her to get up, get her son, and hold him. For God has a plan for him. Hold his hand. Take him with you. God is telling Hagar, don't give up on your son. I've got a plan for him yet. Verse 19, then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. What this means is she was looking for water, and God enabled her to find water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink, and God was with the boy, and he grew up, and he lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. So God enabled her to find water by leading her to a well. She fills the skin that Abraham had given her with water and gave it to Ishmael for a drink. And this was the turning point for both of them. God was with Ishmael. Over time, he he enabled Ishmael to grow up and excel with the bow. As he got older, he became more experienced with the bow and was very gifted as a hunter, which enabled him to make a good living. To the point where he was able to take a wife. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, which was between where Abraham was and Egypt. His mother brings him a wife from Egypt, which was her homeland. God kept his promise to provide and care for Ishmael. Now, I find four important applicable lessons that we can learn from this account. Number one, these are just some things I think we can take away from this account. We are to entrust our children unto the Lord. 
Perhaps you understand a little bit of what Abraham went through. Though maybe the circumstances were as, as dire, I'd say if you have older kids, you at least can feel for Abraham. Dropping off your child to college for the first time can be a little scary, can't it? Moving your children out of the house and watching them start their own life can be a bit nerve-wracking. Or how about seeing your child off overseas to go to war or on the mission field? Or perhaps the child is moving out in less than ideal conditions and you have to watch them make mistake after mistake. One of the hardest things in life is entrusting your children to the Lord. This was hard for Abraham, even with his great faith, to trust the Lord to take care of Ishmael. As a parent, we oftentimes feel like our hands are tied behind our back when it comes to our children. What does God want us to do in these unpleasant moments? Entrust them to him. You see, God gave Abraham Ishmael. God gifted him with the opportunity for 16 to 18 years to, to teach and provide for his son. But then it was time to let him go. That's not what Abraham wanted to do. The circumstances were not what he wanted. But God told him to let him go, and he obeyed. He entrusted him to the Lord. As parents, that's all we can do. We pray for our children, and we entrust them to God, because ultimately, they belong to him. And don't think that day was just hard for Abraham, and it was easy the next day. No. You know he worried about his son, and the next day worried about his son, and the next day worried about his son. He had to continually give his son to God. Lord, I trust you with my child. As 1 Peter 5 says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. That includes your children. They're a big part of your anxiety. I bet we worry more about our children than anything else in life. I bet we worry more about our children than everything else put together in our life. We, we give it to God. Lord, I'm, I'm trusting you. I'm asking you to provide. I'm asking you to do a salvific work in their heart. Because what I so desperately desire, I cannot make happen. Only you can. Second thing I think we learned from this account is that we must deal with conflict before it gets out of hand. I won't spend too much time on this because we've seen this with Abraham before. But Abraham knew the situation. He just didn't want to deal with it. He knew the tension was rising. He knew this was going to get worse and worse over time. He knew it would not go well with Ishmael when he left absolutely everything to Isaac. He, he knew Ishmael was supposed to start his own great nation and it would be separate from his brothers. But to make the hard decision to send him away, though it was inevitable, was hard for Abraham. But I think over time, the additional conflict that this saved was worth it. Sometimes making a firm decision to deal with conflict is very hard. Nobody wants to make difficult calls, but it's often necessary in our jobs, in our families, and even in our ministry. Conflict must be dealt with not ignored. Conflict doesn't just go away. It gets worse and worse and will continue to do so until it's dealt with. We must deal with the conflict head on before it gets out of hand. Thankfully, God intervenes and makes this clear to Abraham. And Abraham deals with it. Third, 
lesson I think we can take from this account is seeing that we are called to submit to God's will even when we do not like it. Abraham doesn't want to do what God is calling him to do, but he does it anyways. It displeased God. God said, do it anyways, and Abraham did it. Sometimes, I would even say oftentimes, God calls you to do things you don't want to do. And in those moments, you have to deny yourself and simply obey God. The Christian life, don't, don't, don't mistake the Christian life to be you always have to agree with God. The Christian life is not a life of always agreeing with God. I don't always like God's plan for me. For the most part, due to my flesh, I want to follow the easiest path. God often wants me to go down the more difficult path, which I never want to go down. Though I'm prone to find the path of least resistance, God often leads us down the best road, not the easiest road in life. We're more about ease and comfort. God's more about growing our faith and our character and what what road will lead us to the most sanctification. An important part of growing as a Christian is being open to, to the will of God, no matter what it might be, and then truly being obedient to his will. Lord, I will go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do, even if I don't like it or understand it. If I know it's your will, I'll do it. I feel like so many times we're under the impression that, yeah, I'll do what, I, what God wants me to do as long as I want to do it. Well, we've got to be willing to do things we don't want to do that God's calling us to do. We need to have this attitude of, Lord, if I know your will, I'll do it, even if it's not my will. So reveal your will to me. When we come to God open, Abraham was not shut to the idea of doing what his wife said. As soon as God told him to, okay, Lord, I know your will. I will do it. It's a hard prayer. It's a, it's a God-honoring prayer, but very difficult to pray as Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. Sometimes your will and God's will don't line up. In those times, you want to choose God's will, not your will. As James 4, 7 says, submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Submit means do what he wants you to do, even if you don't want to do it. And we, we got all kinds of tactics for this, right? We'll, we'll be like, oh, that just that can't be God's will, or God, doesn't, God wants me to be happy, or God wants me to do this, or God, God, God can't be calling me to do that. He just can't. And I'm just encouraging us to be open. Are you open to God's will? Are you open to the Lord leading you? Are you willing to obey no matter what he calls you to do? Or do you have some, I'll do this as long as I don't do this? I remember sitting in my house down in southern Kansas and saying to the Lord, and I'm I'm honest, I really said this to the Lord. Lord, I'll go anywhere you send me, just don't send me north. (laughs) And I, here I am, northern Iowa, middle of April, snowing outside. Yeah, Lord, I'll go anywhere you send me, even north. It starts with truly being open to God's will. Are you willing to obey even when you don't want to? That's part of being a mature Christian. Number four, 
I, th- I think this is the one that hit me the hardest this week. We often need to focus on just taking the next step when we don't know what God wants us to do. Sometimes in life, we find ourselves in the position that Hagar found herself in. She was tossed out into the wilderness with the teenage boy with nothing but what she could carry. When she runs out of water, she gives up, not knowing what to do next. But God comes to her and informs her to get up, take the boy, and move forward. She didn't know where. She was just called to put one foot in front of the other and keep going. Soon, because she was obedient to God, she found water. Then what? She doesn't know. What do I do now? One day at a time, God's will for her and her son began to unfold. I mean, it all happens in like two verses But that took years. You might not be able to see where God is leading you. You may have no idea what's next or what you're supposed to be doing. You may be confused at what God's plan is for your life. In those moments, just focus on obeying him today. Right where he has you. You may not be able to see the future, but just focus on obeying him today. Jesus told us this in Matthew 6, 34. He says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I mean, I'm just thinking if I, if I was Ishmael or Hagar and I was sitting there thinking, okay, he says he's going to make us into a great nation, but what are we supposed to do? Just keep going. Do what he says to do today. And then tomorrow wake up, do what he says to do, and just watch it happen. It's, it's going to happen. The promise will unfold, but we have to be obedient. And sometimes we don't know. Sometimes we want to see the big picture so we know where we're, where we're going and how we're going to get there. And we just live obediently each day, knowing that God's will for us will unfold. Keep obeying him one day at a time until he opens a door or reveals his will for you. Be willing, be trusting, be obeying. Lord, I'm willing to do anything you lead me to do, and I'm trusting you to lead me. I will obey. This is what we call total surrender to God. Because God doesn't always show you the path, but he does lead. A little bit at a time. I always think of the uh, God's people, the Israelites, when they were going into the promised land. And they get to the Jordan River. God doesn't tell them how to cross the river. But the, the priests that were carrying the ark, God told them to just go into the promised land. There's a river between them and the promised land. God didn't tell us what to do, so you know what we're going to do? We're just going to keep going. And as soon as they put one foot into the water, the water separates, and they were able to walk across in dry land. But they had to make that first step. And they didn't know what would happen until they made that first step. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Lord, I'm going to deny myself, and I'm going to follow you. Wherever you lead me today, that's where I'm going. And I'll get up tomorrow and do the same thing. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Are you doing that? Are you acknowledging him today? Will you acknowledge him tomorrow? Because if you do that, he will make straight your path. He, will, he, will, he may only show you the path today. And then tomorrow he'll show you the path the next day. But he will show you the path. He will make that path 
straight. It may be foggy in your life right now. You may not have a clear picture of where the Lord is leading you, what's going on. I think of the graduates coming up next month, graduating. Maybe you're a graduate and you're like, I don't know what God has for me. I don't know what's next in my life. It's okay. Just one step at a time. Let the Lord reveal that to you over time as you're obedient. Or maybe you're there and you're an adult and maybe you're... Your last child's moving out, or you're an empty nester, or you're just like, what what does God have for me now? Just one day at a time, obey Him, trust Him, see where He leads you. Because just as Ishmael has a promise that God would make him into a great nation, we have promises from God too. That God has a plan for our life. His plan isn't to hurt us, it's not to harm us, it's to prosper us. He's given us gifts, he has a calling for us, he has a plan for each and every one of you. Though you may not see what that entails for the next 10, 20 years, just focus on today and he will lead you throughout the way. Father, we thank you for knowing that we have a faithful guide to lead us and to direct us in this life. I know we get into some pretty dire situations as Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael were in, but I pray, Lord, that when we are in those times that you would help us to remain faithful. I pray that everyone here, Lord, would be willing to completely surrender their life to you that they'd be willing to go wherever you send them, to do whatever you call them to do, to live how you call them to live, even if they don't want to, that they would be obedient. And that as we're obedient, Lord, we would trust you to lead us. Even when we can't see where you're leading us, that we would trust that you are. And that we would walk the path you have for us in obedience. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.